the same as previous, so please sit on your questions until the poster session preceding this and save all of your insightful critique and questions and commentary until then. Uh, I would like to introduce the first paper, which is Musical and Metamusical Conversations, written by Oded Bental and David Dolan. Uh, please forgive any mispronunciation of names. Uh, I will pass the microphone over to Oded to present. Thank you. So uh, I'm opening. Uh the third time I'm opening a session this uh, conference, so apparently uh, having a name in B uh, helps. So this uh, poster that David Dolan and I will be presenting uh, is about our performance from uh, Wednesday. Uh, and as you could see in here, so this is about human and, or human and AI uh, communicating in real time performance within a tonal context. And uh, we are coming at it from two different angles. So David is a performer, improviser. I'm a composer and as you could, so my preferred mode of engaging with music is like yesterday's concert. I'm behind the scenes, the computer does everything, the performers are responsible. I'm just kind of sitting there and being nervous. And, but David insisted that we should be improvising together on stage, and our paper uh, describes the process of arriving at that. And I want to, uh, for the benefit of those of you who missed the concert, I'm going to try and play uh, a bit. Do I just go back or how? Do, oh, yeah. So this is uh, a recording. Will it open? Ah. Oh. <laughs> God Almighty, what do I do now? Okay, let's see if it works. Phenomenal. If I do this, uh, do I not play? Oh, now I have uh, two files here. Ah. Uh. Share with Skype. performance is that um, I designed a system that responds in real time to what David it does. It takes information from him from the microphone, uh, uh, infers some musical uh, things on it and responds in real time. All the moment-to-moment -moment decisions are done automatically in the system. I'm there just kind of navigating the system uh, kind of as a kind of film director who's kind of nudging he, uh, her actors uh, in various directions. Um, and our paper is written as a conversation between us because we are interested in kind of the musical dialogue that happens in the music while we're playing 
and it's surrounded, arriving at this point, is surrounded through conversation that over a long, lengthy period of time developed and allowed us to create this um, uh, improvisation. So uh, in our poster, we tried to kind of summarize some key issues about David's idea about improvisation, how I approached this, and how our um, ideas merged. And we have uh, a few uh, recorded examples and headphones and uh, for you to um, enjoy or suffer from. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next paper is Silicon for Orchestra and Artificial Intelligence. Three strategies for incorporating artificial intelligence into the compositional process of orchestral music, written and presented by Robert Laidlow. Oh, got to hold this up here. It's like a YouTube podcast. Oh, that's it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, I'm Rob Laidlow. I'm a composer, and I'm based at uh, Jesus College, Oxford, at the moment. But this work uh, for orchestra was done as part of my PhD, which was with uh, PRISM, the Centre for Practice and Research in Science and Music at the Royal Northern College of Music, and in association with the, the BBC Philharmonic, who performed this piece. Um, and what I'm sort of presenting today, I suppose, is a, yeah, sort of a paper, sort of a poster, but really it's a piece of music. So pl please have a listen to the piece of music if you want to um, really understand what I'm going for with this because um, that's the form that it's kind of intended to be in. But I really enjoyed writing up some specific bits about my process and how I was thinking about AI um, in this paper and poster, which I'll be um, covering today. So um, it's a really big piece of orchestra, and it's not only about AI, but a lot of it is about AI. And I suppose it's about and uses AI in, in two different ways. So one was that uh, in this paper, I'm trying to situate the orchestra as a really exciting place to explore the, the affordances of AI, that it's actually um, a, a space that is unlike any other space in, in music, and that's quite useful for um, thinking about creativity. And on the flip side, that using AI tools can be a really exciting space to explore what an orchestra is and how it might function today and what an orchestra of the future or an orchestra that includes these kinds of technologies might look like and how that might be um, relevant or interesting. Um, so in terms of uh, what I've written in the paper today, um, I've kind of uh, broken down the way that I've used AI in this orchestral piece into uh, three different um, terms, which I've called composer-like, instrument-like, and performer-like. And these are kind of a iteration on Rebecca Feebrink's design time and performance time definitions, which I'm sure lots of you are aware of. Um, and I found this uh, a really helpful way to think about using AI in this uh, process. So when I say composer-like, I mean things that contribute uh, ideas or kernels to the music that you don't necessarily hear on the surface of the music, but are the fundamental to the construction of the sound. Uh, when I say instrument-like, uh, I mean, obviously, that's a, a key theme of this conference. I think you kind of all understand what I mean by that. But things that are um, used by human performers who are probably normally used to using their normal instruments, especially in orchestral context. How can AI, uh, I guess, expand the palette of an orchestral performer in this case? What can it afford these performers that maybe their regular cello or piano or whatever doesn't? And when I say performer-like, I mean how can AI be integrated into the social fabric of an orchestra um, in a way that uh, is maybe a little bit more uh, interesting, for me at least, than um, the traditional uh, outsider or insider, this kind of way that electronics are often integrated into orchestral textures. Um, so that was how I, I broke that down. And I think that um, I found these categories really useful, not only for my creative process, but also thinking about wider themes in AI and how AI links to orchestral work. For example, in the first movement, the composer-like movement, I sort of um, uh, look at the relationship between the future and the past. Why is so much uh, AI, generative AI research, focused on recreating music of the past? Why is so much orchestral programming focused on also recreating music of the past. I thought that was a really fun direction to investigate. 
instrument-like. I was interested in authenticity. What does it mean to play fake music? Does fake music become more real when an orchestra plays it? What does it mean to embed an instrument inside an orchestra, which is itself making sort of style transfer, deep fake sounds? Does it become more real when performed by a human? And performer-like, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I suppose the question here was, uh, what is left of an orchestral performance if we assume in the future it will be possible to completely um, simulate an orchestral performance using AI, maybe neural synthesis can make something completely indistinguishable from orchestras. What is left? Why do we go and see orchestras? That was kind of what I was exploring with this sort of performer-like element as well. And um, this picture is of the conductor Vimbayi Kaziboni conducting the premiere. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a sort of rough overview of what I was looking at, but yeah, pl please do have a look at the video and read the paper to have a little less garbled uh, explanation of that. Um, and yes, uh, come and talk to me later. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. The next paper is Human AI Musicking, a framework for designing AI for music co-creativity, written by Craig Via, Steve Benford, Juan Martinez Avila, and Solomia Moroz. Hi everyone, sorry about the technical faff there. Does this count as part of my five minutes? <laughs> okay, so yes, we've developed this human AI um, musicking framework um, that's part of, kind of part of the ongoing work that Steve and I are doing in Mixed Reality Lab, but it's also part of my DigiScore project, which is uh, ERC funded consolidator grant. Um, I've got to make some bold statements in the five minutes. So what am I looking at in terms of human AI musicking? Well, musicking means to do music. So obviously I'm examining what happens inside music. I also advocate Small's definition that in the acts of musicking, it establishes in the place where it is happening a set of relationships. And that for me is the central currency here. I'm looking at those relationships that musicians um, connect with, bind with, um, reach out to the materials, the agents, the AI, and, and that for me is the kind of evaluation currency. I understand music to be this kind of double embodied process, certainly if you're working with instruments, that you embody your instruments, a single unit. And then, as we saw with Elaine's um, demonstration of the two pianists finding each other as sound, not as articulation of switches on a piano, but as the sound they were making, <coughs> making latent connections there, I think that's another embodied process that happens inside musicking. So really, I'm kind of trying to get to this subjective experience of the doer, this phenomenon of experience. So it's an inside perspective, and this is all an explanation of a rationale for, you know, or the perspective of the framework. It naturally implicates the I and the self as the primary perceiver, and therefore it's, you, you're kind of reaching into phenomenological perspectives. Um, there's many different flavors of phenomenology, but in a sense, it kind of deals with the subjective experience of consciousness within those relationships. So the, re the, the framework is trying to point a designer, a performer, a musician, an analyst, an evaluator into those relationships. Uh, my favorite flavor is Don Ide's phenomenology of listening, but also his techno phenomenology. And he presents a couple of challenges. First of all, he talks about phenomenology from a first and the second perspective, the first one is that instant that you have experience of something, those shifts, the rebalances that the body, mind, whatever, however you want to divide it up, um, happens. Um, and then in the next instant, the mind kicks in and tries to rationalize it, give it form, give it names, give it uh, relationships. You know, the first one is almost impossible to get to, but it's a challenge, I think, um, that I'm taking on board with the Digital Score project, but also as well with this framework, trying to edge us closer to that impossible first phenomenology. 
Um, so the framework really is interested in, in presenting us with questions that might help us understand those shifts and balances as we engage with AI within a musicing realm. It gets us closer, to, could get us closer to what's really going on inside musicking. Um, it's very diffi difficult to define what it is because as soon as we start to define the first phenomenology, we enter into this second phase of giving it labels and therefore all the kind of semantic subjectivity that happens after there. But the primary thing really with this framework is to help us understand the relationships inside musicking from the perspective of a designer, a creator, um, a musician, a doer, maybe an audience. So, look, it deals with a central research question. I've split it into three very easy, um, or relatively easy categories, and Steve, Solomia, Juan, and myself tested it on four different projects which are at different stages of development. Mine, which I'll kind of present as a, a video demo in, alongside with the paper, is dealing with uh, an embodied robotic arm using, uh, which is uh, amplifying the creativity of a disabled musician within an ensemble of uh, able-bodied musicians. Steve's was a kind of ongoing project with Bob with the uh, 4K and N. Um, Juan's was an ideation project and Solomir is just kickstarting the project. So we were using this framework on these four different um, um, uh, uh, positions of where the research is going and the conclusions were encouraging enough to write a paper and to submit it for here and to kind of get it out there early really as as a kind of call to say actually what I would really like to do is the community to engage with these questions um, perhaps help us understand the relevancy of them and what it co could do in order to kind of structure some thinking that gets the AI and the musician closer together inside those relationships that are really important and binding within the making of the music, the real stuff. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. The next paper to be presented is Revisiting Reynolds, Autonomous Agents for Spatio Audiovisual Composition and Performances, written and presented by Damien Ziwis. Do I activate presentation mode? <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Damien Jeevius, and today I want to present you my work on revisiting Reynolds autonomous agents for spatial audiovisual composition and performance. So what is meant with autonomous agents in this context? So here we have a definition um, of uh, by Stan Franklin. An autonomous agent is a system situ situated within and a part of an environment that senses the environment and acts on it over time in pursuit of its own agenda and as to affect what is uh, here, <laughs> uh, what it senses in the future. So generally speaking, we can think of autonomous agents as systems that have some sort of limited knowledge of the environment and adapt their uh, behavior according to it. And we can find autonomous agents in various fields. So, um, for example, in computer games for uh, controlling the behavior of non-playable characters, in artificial life simulations, uh, which are a field of artificial intelligence, and also in spatial composition, where there are uh, various um, yeah, approaches to uh, using autonomous agents um, for the movement of uh, spatial sound sources. And mon many of them are based on um, the concepts by Craig Reynolds. So here we see like two of uh, his famous um, publications uh, on this topic. And so did I, and I implemented the steering behaviors of uh, Siegflee 
arrival, pursuit, evasion, wander, path following, and flocking as AI modules for the ICE 3D engine to steer the movement of uh, visual objects, uh, virtual sound sources in relation to each other, so the autonomous agents, but also the environment, and um, of course also in relation to the movement and interaction of a first person user. So IFS is short for Interactive Virtual Environment System. So it is uh, some sort of modular 3D engine for the Max programming environment. So we can see here um, a picture how, how this looks like. So there are uh, a set of various modules like in this fashion of beep or whistle inside Max. So you can just connect them to each other to create uh, virtual uh, environments. And it uses the famous Earcom SPAD library for spatial audio reproduction on loudspeakers and headphones, Jitter OpenGL for all the 3D related stuff. And it also implements, for example, Graham uh, Wakefield's VR uh, library or the Bose AR framework for VR and AR compatibility. And yeah, there's much more implemented into this. And so I created these AI uh, agent modules. Uh, so here on the left, we see uh, an example how to set this up. So basically the idea is that, to, uh, that one can uh, define various behaviors and movements by just a few clicks and connecting like these boxes here together. Uh, start now this, this is what I like to call the loving birds example. So we have here one autonomous agent like wandering uh, around a given 3D space being pursued by another agent. And this creates this kind of lifelike um, behavior and movement inside the 3D environment. So here we have a path following example. Um, what is special about here also in uh, comparison to like some kind of uh, static tra trajectory movement is that we have like these small variations and deviations on the path, which also creates like a more, yeah, nature-like, lifelike movement of these objects on a given path. So we can use these paths and trajectories, for example, to steer certain uh, visual objects and sound sources in a composition space or uh, uh, spatial uh, installation and much more. So we also have here this path following agent also being pursued by another agent. Yeah, so the last example is uh, the floppy behavior of uh, five virtual sound sources also here being, uh, being pursued by another autonomous agent represented by this uh, pink tube. And yeah, this also shows like how you can combine various uh, behaviors and agents to create certain, source, uh, certain scenarios and uh, yeah, combinations of behaviors. So this of course is only like a very basic example, only showing you a glimpse of what is possible and uh, yeah, by yeah, applying you know, it in a creative context. And yeah, that's it. So I'm looking to your questions and also to show you more at the poster session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next paper is Liveness and Machine Listening in Musical Live Coding, a conceptual framework for designing agent-based systems, written and presented by Yorgos Diopoulos. Hello, uh, is it, what's the shortcut? Uh, the shortcut for full screen? Is it, uh, uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Uh, Hello, my name is Georges Diabulis. I am a 
PhD student at Chalmers University of Technology and University of Gothenburg in Gothenburg, Sweden. I'm uh, writing my thesis. I'll be talking to you about liveness and machine listening uh, in musical live coding, a conceptual framework for designing agent-based systems. Now, mu musical live coding, uh, what is it? It's uh, we apply modifications to a running program. So literally, this is uh, similar to hot swapping. Here we see uh, a hardware module hot plug to a running system without shutting down the system. Metaphorically, is the dramatization of a computer program. The term was coined by computer mu musicians 20 years ago. It relates to liveness in programming environments, education of programming, audiovisual and performance arts. Now, liveness um, in programming environments was introduced by Tanimoto in 1990. In 2013, he revised his hierarchy and he added two more levels, levels five and six of liveness. Now, in live coding, in music performance, we uh, essentially live in this level four liveness, meaning that the system is informative, significant, responsive, and live. Level five is tactical predictive. An example would be the autocomplete functionality of modern text editors uh, and IDs. And then uh, strategical predictive level six is uh, you have a system that can predict users' intentions uh, in a manner. Uh, now, uh, this is about uh, an observation study I did. So I watched the videos online. I had uh, a few selection criteria. There has to be an article, an uh, academic article, and then video demo from uh, video demo performance. And I try to explain how we do live coding. So I, I draw a high level uh, diagrammatic representation. The human writes some text, translates to code, and then uh, the code uh, renders to music through sound. Uh, in real life, the human also listens to the sound. And because we are talking about s uh, agent based sy systems, we also need a software agent. So we have the human agent and the machine agent. Now, in this case, in this scenario, the software agent is not informed by anything. So none of the systems was based on this simple schematic. So there are three systems out of the eight that they are, they are informed from the code, and they modify the code prescriptively, and you can see that. There are two more systems that they are informed by the code, but they do not do prescriptive modifications of the code. You cannot see them, essentially. It's, there is one system by Sambo uh, where the system is informed by the music, but from the cloud, so from data, not from typical machine listening we do uh, in real time. Uh, then a system by uh, Nodes, Flock, which is doing machine listening, and uh, it applies uh, modifications on the code that they are visible, uh, making visible uh, through some... Uh, descriptive notation, like some graphs, etc. And then we have Kacharpo, which is doing machine listening and uh, does uh, prescriptive modifications of the code. Now, none of the system was informed by both music and code. So that's that would be a future work. Now, uh, from this, the, the above exercise, let's say, I end up to three domains, the code, the software agents, and the, musics, the music. And uh, I have three categories, affordances, temporal constraints, and uh, what I call here negative time scales uh, based on Tanimoto's uh, keynote from ICLC 2015. Now, uh, so I have these three horizontal categories, three vertical domains, and I take the systems and I map them through trajectories into the framework. So we see here a system by Atanayaki and colleagues uh, which is not doing any machine listening. Uh, it does visible modifications on the code on the prescriptive part. It has two modes, uh, either on demand or uh, with immediate effect. And then the system may be le level five because it does some code previews. And the agents uh, do tasks that humans cannot, etc. It does online learning, multiple agents, etc. Then I take another system that has machine listening. It does machine listening uh, control of live coding based on uh, this from 2015 Collins paper on machine listening. And it does machine listening on different levels, like from 
high level, this does a style limitation, uh, structural, feature level, signal level, etc. And then I provide a code example in Super Collider and I map it to the framework. So the idea is that the, the framework is modular and uh, the user can employ the map using the Super Collider code example. I thank you and looking forward to talk to you in the poster session. Thank you very much. The next paper to be presented is Virtual AI Jam, AI-driven virtual musicians for human in-the-loop musical improvisation, written by Torin Hopkins, Alvin Jude, Greg Phillips, and Ellen Doe, and presented by Torin Hopkins. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Torin Hopkins. I'm a PhD candidate at the Atlas Institute of University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I'm presenting this work on behalf of my colleagues Alvin Jude, uh, Greg Phillips from Erickson Research, and my advisor uh, Ellen, Ellen Yiluen Du. So um, this is Virtual AI Jam. And some of our goals in creating this were basically to create a pipeline for visually responsive and embodied uh, virtual characters. We saw a need for creating um, AI that was connected to some type of animated character. Uh, this has been seen in robotics and elsewhere, um, but we like as a musician, as, uh, sorry, as a musician myself who likes to jam and play music with other people, um, I wanted to have something that was visually represented. And another goal was just to create a pipeline for uh, AI-driven music interaction and ultimately put it in the hands of musicians and see what, how they felt about it and if there were things that uh, we left unexplored. So how we went about doing this was uh, we uh, structured it almost entirely in Ableton and Max. So we had uh, MIDI notes that were taken and stored in a local file uh, through Max, and then um, that was translated through uh, Python using Magenta and their algorithms. Um, we used their neural networks to create output and then played that output through a virtual port, and that was sent back to our digital audio workstation to both trigger the sound samples in Ableton as well as trigger animations in uh, Unity. So I'll show you a quick example of what this looks like um, in the lab. So it's a colleague playing um, into uh, the drum and then it's running through the Python scripts and translating via OSC. And making a reactive avatar. Uh, we then took this system and uh, wanted to have interviews with musicians and we did it in a semi-structured interview um, style which means that we broke it up into three parts so we wouldn't uh, influence the musicians by just showing them the demo. And first, we just had them describe uh, their musical practice, ultimately, to just get a better understanding of what they were doing and how uh, these tools might be able to help them. But before we, um, before we asked them how they could use AI, we actually demoed the system just a little bit and talked to them during that uh, process and recorded the whole thing and transcribed it. Then we asked them, based on their experiences with AI, as well as the system that we showed them, how they might be able to incorporate uh, AI into their musical practice. And again, these are both lay and professional musicians. Um, and so we saw some differences. Again, both, both of these groups played music for an average of 20 years or so. Um, so the, the big differences that we saw were the non-professional musicians really wanted practice tools um, that help correct their music 
And another really interesting uh, aspect of this where uh, they really enjoyed this non-human, non-judgmental jam partner. So a lot of what prohibits people from playing music with one another is the fact that they're afraid of what other people think of them. So when you have this embodied character, um, yeah, it, it doesn't judge you. Um, and then the professionals really like the visual interaction. Actually, going back to a question someone asked earlier, uh, you can have musical cues, you can demonstrate it as listening, you can kind of do part switching, you can move like your instrument up and down to demonstrate uh, musical parts inside of like what would traditionally be done in a musical performance or jam session. Um, yeah, so please uh, see the paper for more details. I'll also be giving a performance utilizing the system tonight, uh, right before the algo rave after dinner. So please be sure to come in. It's an interactive performance, so you can play the drum and you're gonna influence the AI that will then uh, force me to jam with it. So again, my name is Torin Hopkins uh, and this was Virtual AI Jam. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We're now going to head into the Alt AIMC section of this uh, paper session. The first paper is in this bracket is introducing the Calcio using causal interference to influence collaboration in a shared music making environment written and presented by Steve Simmons. Hello. Right, so I'm Steve Simons. I am a PhD uh, student here at Sussex, where I am uh, based in uh, music technology, but I'm actually funded uh, at the Biomimic and Embodied AI uh, Centre, uh, in which is associated with informatics. I'm looking at how people behave in uh, what I'm calling shared musical ma music making environments. And invariably people go to me like, oh, well, do I move on? How do I move to? <sighs> Click. It's not going to the next. Yeah. They go, what, what, like a band? And we've seen quite a lot of this. We've seen the, the idea that you come to a music making environment, you've got an instrument, someone else has got an instrument, and then we adapt how we play together. And I go, well, no, not quite like a band. Because I want to look at the way that people actually become a lot more intrinsically hybridized, a lot more involved with each other. And so I, I then go, OK, so I've got this. I'm using at the minute, uh, uh, you might, guys, people might recognize this. It's called a game track. It's a way of, uh, tra we can use it to track people's hands in uh, space. So the next stage, people go, oh, so you mean like it's two people playing one instrument? So you've got two people sharing a guitar or sharing a piano or something. Again, I say this is quite individualized. You've got your part, someone else has got their part. I'm looking at trying to bring ways of bringing people closer and closer together. So the next stage on could be that you wrap on top of this the system of people playing and an audio synthesis, a, a, a way of like, interconnecting them in some way. Uh, maybe there's a measuring system which is then uh, adjusting the individual's behavior. We've all, you know, if you improvise, sometimes you improvise with someone who is a bit more dominant or doesn't listen to you. It wouldn't be nice to turn their volume down a bit. So one suggestion is like this. Now for me, this relies very much on the way that you're analyzing and controlling. And it's wrapping an extra layer of complexity onto something which is, you know, has already uh, got some very, uh, layers of um, issues with it. So I'm proposing, and this is the provocation, and um, it is part of the research, uh, is to entangle people, to find different ways of combining their action before the synthesis. So at this point, I've brought a prop in. 
An easy ob way of imagining this is a stick. And this is one of my instruments uh, where players hold each end of a stick. And so naturally, the shared behavior that they have that, uh, is then used to um, control the synthesis system. So this way, there is a single interface that you both players have to engage in in order to uh, play the, the musical instrument. Now, there are variable, you know, various ways of doing this. If we, what happens if we get over the stick and we give people a bit more of a free freedom in the way they move, move their hands? So uh, the system I've proposed here, uh, and that I will have set up, is um, based on a method of measuring people's behavior. And it gives this kind of, it looks at the people, looks at the players, and it's going, are they working together? Are they coordinated in their movements? And when you are, it plays, you know, for example, it calms the music down. And when you're not, it, it goes a bit crazy. Now, the effect of this is that it really constrains your behavior. So the, the nature of the entanglement becomes really strict. And in order to do something different, you have to break what is a, quite a natural kind of movement. Um, so in the demo, there's a paper that explains this, but I will be there with a number of my instruments and some headphones, and you can come and play them. Uh, there's also a, a website which is linked there, but there's also a QR code on the poster which has got ongoing development of videos and other information. Okay, see you there. Thank you, and sorry for cutting you off 10 <laughs> seconds short. Um, I'll make that up with an extra 10 seconds of no, no, having no, a demo no. <laughs> with it. All right, so the next paper to be presented is going to be uh, presented remotely. It's Accessible Co-Creativity Through Language and Voice Input, written by Pratik Virma, Konstantin Basica, Patricia Alessandrini, and Alexandru Bersano. So I'm just going to start that for everyone now. Hi everyone, my name is Konstantin Basika. I'm currently a postdoc at the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, or KARMA at Stanford University, and I'm presenting the project Accessible Co-Creativity with AI through Language and Voice Input with my collaborators, Pratik Verma, Patricia Alessandrini, and Alessandro Berchan. We introduce a set of tools for humans to be able to co-create music with AI-based architectures. Our main goal was to employ AI to generate and retrieve music that is coherent to vocal input in various modes language, humming, singing, or any other utterances. The aim is for human musicians or non musicians to be able to expand their creative capabilities by guiding neural architectures to understand language and musical nuances. Another main goal of the project is accessibility. We want people with various abilities and disabilities to be empowered to explore music creation by interacting with machines. The four tools we propose can be used for composition, improvisation, and or performance. Our first tool was developed for intermedia performance, and it was implemented in a series of eight theater music shows. We have to clarify that our goals were different from systems such as Google's Music LM or diffusion-based architectures, which aim to generate music as a response to text descriptors. We wanted to customize the music generation to the style of the composer, who in this case was me. So we worked with MIDI instead of audio because the show's narrative demanded a self-playing piano to be able to improvise. We trained a neural network to understand the contents of a text and match specific words or their synonyms to a library of piano improvisations uh, that I recorded in response to those keywords. During the live performances, audience members were invited to share stories and our AI system improvised subjectively congruent music on a Yamaha disc audio, which then accompanied bodily improvisation of other audience members. In a second iteration, we continued using MIDI because audio-based music generation was just not feasible under our resource constraints. 
but we wanted to make our system more accessible, so we expanded the possibilities of MIDI music generation. We moved from melodic improvisation to a multi-track variational autoencoder system developed by Hugo Magenta, which can fill in the gap between MIDI bars through interpolations. We trained our system on MTG Jamenda open dataset, and then we used a subset of uh, almost 8,000 tracks from the open source LAC MIDI dataset, which are matched and aligned to audio tracks from the million song dataset. Divided in three second chunks of audio, our system tagged all tracks with the 57 moves, thus resulting in a library of almost 8,000 identically tagged multi track MIDI files. Given a new text, our system can detect the word families of the 57 tags and select snippets of corresponding MIDI music, which are then fed as input bars to generate cascading music VAE MIDI interpolations. Again, considering the accessibility of our system, in this third tool, we implemented a different mode of employing the human voice. Instead of words, we invite people to sing or hum to drive the music VAE MIDI generation. Live audio input from the user is converted into monophonic MIDI, and specific segments are used as MIDI bars to trigger the interpolations of the music VA model in the same manner as described before. In addition to the voice input, the user also has some options for driving co-creativity. They can choose which bars are used for interpolations and they can adjust them by inputting the number of bars and the temperature, similar to language work. In the event centering disability and online musical experiences, we collaborated with Alexander Brotsman a semi-verbal participant with profound autism, who performed with and provided feedback on the system. You can listen to some excerpts of this demonstration by scanning the QR code. To even further increase accessibility, we invite people to use their voice in any way, singing, humming, speaking, or any vocal noises. In fact, users can make any other non-vocal sounds or noises, but we limit our description to the voice for the scope of this presentation. Instead of music generation, here we extended a query by humming system to retrieve matching music. For our first iteration, we used the library of 41 hours piano music by various classical composers. The retrieval was achieved by proximity of the layer and space of the query audio to the entire piano music library. For our first demo, we invited our autistic participant to interact with the system by recording his voice and selecting the name of a listed composer or searching the entire database. The system found the closest match to the vocal recording and played it back. Thank you so much to the organizers of this conference and to you for your attention. I hope you can join me later at the poster session where we have more information and I'd be thrilled to hear your feedback and questions. Thank you very much. And the final paper to be presented in this session is Intimate Musical Collaboration with a Probabilistic Model, written and presented by Carl Jonsson. Hi, my name is Carl Johansson, and I'm going to tell you about some work I've been doing at the Intelligent Instruments Lab in Reykjavik, Iceland, along with Thor Magnusson and Victor Shepardson, as well as our collaborator in uh, Bilbao, the University of Bilbao, uh, Enrique Hurtado. And we've been working with um, a collaborative instrument. Thanks for explaining that, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Named the Telaparta. And uh, yes, so essentially what we want to do is create a system that can replace one of the two players on this collaborative instrument and uh, sort of gauge the experience of playing an intimate instrument. Intimate, uh, yeah, well, it's an intimate experience playing with a, with a a collaborative instrument. So, the Celeparta, there should be a video there. Is this a, oh, there we go. 
It's an ancient Basque percussion instrument. It's played by two people simultaneously in a call and response fa fashion. So they're playing consecutively. One person plays with, uh, hits the, with the batons and another one does. It's a lot easier to show this, I think, but I'm not sure if this is gonna work. Oh, okay. This show, I can't help it. For 45,000 people with toenail fungus, and it can help you too. I'll just skip into this. They don't usually play this, play this fast, but uh, this is more fun. to do is replace essentially one of those performers with a computer system. Let's see if this works. And to do that, we recorded, or well, we had our collaborators in Bilbao record data, we placed um, contact microphones on, on the planks and batons, and they recorded up to five hours of, of telepata playing in I think seven sessions. We then process this data and as you can see there on the right the the top one is an audio recording the next four are batons and we just did onset detection on the batons and created uh, events from them to feed into the model and for this we used notochord which some of you might be familiar with after yesterday's concert or Wednesday's um, workshop it's a deep probabilistic model for sequences of structured events. It's recently developed at the Intelligent Instruments Lab by Victor Shepardson. And it is intended for a performance setting. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a collaborator. Uh, the notochord is pre-trained on the last MIDI dataset. And we subsequently trained it on the expanded Groove MIDI dataset, which was adjusted to look more like the Telepata data, which we finally fine-tuned it on. Later, we added a visualization of this, of the collaborator. We wanted to see how, if people would experience it differently to play with um, a virtual player than just hearing the sound. Uh, visual cues are an important part of musical performances. So the entire system looks like this. It's uh, the sensors feed into the listener, which is implemented in Super Collider for those interested, detect onsets, and sends them to the predictor, which is notochord, which then predicts the next hit and sends it to the sound output, which is a DAW, uh, Reaper in our case, as well as sending it to Unity to uh, signify the, the intent of the AI. show you a short demo. This is actually from April. It turns out there are very few experienced cello pasta players in Iceland. <laughs> in fact, probably none. So this is a demo from Andrew Wizard in, in April. There was a cello pasta workshop held by the Intelligent Instruments Lab. <laughs> This is ongoing work. Enrique is still collecting data and we are working on simplifying the setup and documenting it. There's also a user study starting next week where we're gonna gauge the experience of playing with the system as a whole. And so we have a demo. We've actually set up the cello pasta down. It's gonna probably be outside the meeting house so you can try it. If the if it's not raining still, I hope you come and try it. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. That draws this session to a close. A special thank you again to all of the paper presenters. Uh, now is the time to, there's going to be a short interlude, but now is the time to unleash all of your questions in the poster session and test out some of the fantastic demos. Uh, same space as usual, and Thor, was there? Yeah, I just wanted to say a little thing about the pub, uh, pub uh, org, uh, pub, 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 <laughs> pub org publications. Sorry, not not this. I'm gonna go a bit m in more detail. May I am C two or C three. Um, we would be really happy, and it's kind of just for us as a community. Um, taking care of our proceedings and being proud of our proceedings and for coming conferences to see and maybe the next conference is going to um, use the PubPub system. It would be really great if people would just put their thumbnails up. You go onto the PubPub and you just stick in a thumbnail. And also you can see in some cases uh, there is the author lacking. So um, here, for example. Thanks. So yeah, <laughs> um, if everybody would just put their thumbnails in and so on, it's going to look much better and it's going to be more interesting to look at the proceedings and we are all going to be quicker to find the paper that we're looking at and so on. Just a little note. Thank you. And now there's uh, lunch, right? Post decision post 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 and yeah, following. <laughs> you just said that. Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Let's stop.